Lon, what's the holdup? Had a transportation issue. Okay, diverting rubber. Pick up LZ will be to your east. Welcome to the Squad Better series. An eccentric collection of immersively over-the-top background information aimed at furthering your enjoyment of Squad. My name is Lawn Darts, and this episode I'm on a special assignment looking for cooperative combined arms tactical team play. This is what I do. I search out experiences to get immersed in. Where players come together. Where teamwork thrives. Where the dream is made real. When I find such experiences, I document it for your entertainment and enlightenment. Mods are a great way to get even more enjoyment out of Squad. And the Dynamic Direction mod of Karma Cut Community is a perfect example of such a mod. In this presentation, Squad Better, Episode 4, we find out what Dynamic Direction is. We will be taking a look at the core mechanics and intent of this game mode. Talk with the masterminds behind Dynamic Direction and detail what you need to do to play this immersive Squad mod. Okay, let's go. Dynamic Direction is a refinement of the Squad Combined Arms Tactical Team Play experience centered upon the Occupation Game Mode. Of primary importance in the Occupation Game Mode is the AO which is represented on the tactical map by the outer purple circle. The placement of the AO varies from match to match with size set larger or smaller depending on map and layer dimensions. The purpose of the AO within the Occupation Game Mode is to centralise action, influence FOB placement, drain a team's tickets if they are constantly outnumbered by the enemy within the AO, and act as a mercy bleed mechanic if significantly wiped out of the AO. In Dynamic Direction, the second inner purple circle is set to encourage conventional force forward operating bases to be placed away from the AO boundary. Conventional forces are limited to having one fob at any point in time and will gain two tickets per minute if it is within the inner purple circle, and only one ticket per minute if it is placed inside the AO but outside the inner purple circle. A one ticket per minute differential does not sound like much, but over the course of a 60 minute match it can be a major factor in defeat or victory. I strongly recommend when in leadership of conventional forces to place your forward operating base within the inner purple circle. Look to utilize advantageous terrain, taking into consideration key points of AO control, natural lines of drift, likely vectors of enemy movement, primary directions of fire, and ease of securing lines of supply. Irregular forces are limited to three caches up at a time, anywhere within the AO with each draining one ticket from the enemy team every minute. Irregular force leadership should generally look to position their caches to support guerrilla-style warfare within the AO creating multiple avenues of attack and mounting pressure. Conventional forces, in addition to their main FOB, can place patrol bases. These are temporary spawn and organization areas that are intended to create dynamic sub-objectives within the AO that punish teams that turtle or lose map control. Conventional forces can place one patrol base at a time after enough in-game time has elapsed. Sandbags and ammo crates are the only deployables available. Patrol bases that survive for their full lifespan drain the enemy team of 75 tickets. If the patrol base is captured and dug down by the enemy, your team loses 50 tickets. Once a patrol base is destroyed or completed, there is a cooldown before being able to place another. After five minutes, conventional force fobs are revealed to the enemy on the tactical map by a large red circle positioned on the center of the fob. Patrol bases are revealed to the enemy by a smaller red circle that denotes the patrol base is somewhere within that location, not necessarily the center of the area shown. An irregular force cache position is revealed after 10 minutes and can be anywhere within the rough location denoted by the red circle. Conventional force fobs and patrol bases can only be destroyed by shovels. Command strikes, other explosives and vehicle weapons have no effect on them. They can only be dug down and destroyed by infantry. 
irregular force caches are and only can be destroyed by 2 times IED or C4. Shovels have no effect on them, nor does anything except 2 times IED or C4. This is to stop lone wolf ninjas taking out caches or the enemy commander doing likewise with mortars or off map artillery and airstrikes. Now, just a side note, I am being purposely vague with the availability and cooldown times for patrol bases as these along with other dynamic direction game mechanic variables get constantly tweaked by the mod's vigilant creators. They do this in order to refine the gameplay. As such, I will generally be steering clear of discussing specific values where possible. Current numbers are available on the Steam Dynamic Direction Workshop information pages. Dynamic Direction is not just about modifications to fobs and caches. Various other changes have been made to all aspects of gameplay. We are now going to take a quick tour of these. The first thing you're going to notice when playing, apart from the differences in loadouts and roles, is the infantry locomotion changes. These have been made to create stickier infantry squads and incentivize players to work together and use infantry tactics. Healing, revive and spawn changes have been made to encourage players to wait for friendlies to help them up. The effects of suppression have been increased. This is intended to force players to look for cover or immediately return fire as they would in real life. Every incoming round in proximity to your character will cause a slight flinch. Larger rounds and sustained fire will gradually increase the intensity. The tactical map and marker changes are focused around decreasing visual information on the map to decentivize lone wolfing and encourage communication between command, squad leaders and squad mates. Players can no longer see other blue players on the map aside from their own squad mates and squad leaders and friendly vehicle icons. Squad lead player markers have been changed to NATO unit markers. First person squad leader pings and squad leader marker ranging has been removed as range finders have been added. The commander role has been reworked in order to reinforce the concept that platoon leaders should be leading. Lethal call-ins have had their intensity reduced, frequency increased and support call-ins have been added and adjusted. Extensive rebalancing and thematic realistic platoon sets of all factions have been created together with the addition of completely new factions and inclusion of other modded factions. The up-to-date values for all game mechanic changes together with a fine detail is available on the Dynamic Direction Steam Workshop pages. The intent of all these changes is to create an environment where cooperative, tactical, team-orientated gameplay is the path to victory, from the platoon all the way to the rifleman. It could be argued that tweaks to and addition of mechanics do not guarantee this outcome. However, in my experience, after playing a dozen or so rounds of Dynamic Direction, without question, the level of cooperation within the average match of Dynamic Direction is higher than the average match of Vanilla Squad. I think this is because the intent behind and implementation of this mod is attracting players who are seeking the experience Dynamic Direction has been designed to provide. This more teamwork, communicative and tactics oriented player base thrives because of the mechanics that have been implemented. I'd recommend anyone to try out Dynamic Direction for themselves. It is a lot of fun, but don't just take my word for it. Let's go and talk with the creators behind Dynamic Direction, Karma Cut and the Rubber Pelican. The interview you're about to hear was recorded via a conference Discord call. The footage is from an enjoyable game of Dynamic Direction where I was playing as a rifleman for Afghan Special Battalion alongside Karma Cut and the Rubber Pelican. Karma Cut, when and how did you get involved with Dynamic Direction? So from all the years of me playing squad, I think it's about five years now, at the start we had one life scenarios that we were curating to try to get the most out of squad, as much realism as we could, as much teamwork as we could. And from that, we kind of developed from Squad Ops One Life events into trying to bring that experience into public play, encouraging that level of coordination and teamwork. And the first iteration of Dynamic Direction was actually baked into the hardcore mod from Ops, uh, and that was where Occupation was born. 
Uh, from there, just from how things worked out logistically, uh, we decided to separate the dynamic direction project or occupation game mode from the hardcore mod. And that's kind of where it sits now. It's a project between myself and Raba and a couple small other developers, as well as integration and coordination from Steel Division or Impact Studios uh, to push this project forward. That is very interesting. I'd like to hear more detail about the history and inspiration behind the mod. Uh, so like I said before, a lot of the influence from Dynamic Direction was mainly taking a look at how our squad One Life events uh, were actually improving gameplay by forcing coordination because of the restriction of the One Life uh, kind of scenarios. But that isn't necessarily possible to bring to a public setting. So we kind of had to redesign an entire game mode uh, and just thinking about how all the different aspects of real life infantry combat, whether it's the tactics of it, the minutia of you know, what kits look like and how to, you know, really reconcile the fact that this is a video game and figuring out that balance between real life one or, or one life events and the actual gameplay that's available in public squad. And so a whole new game mode had to be created out of what I also saw were the problems in vanilla gameplay, which was, you know, point to point objective based game mode like AAS was not really conducive to the environment that we wanted to grow. Robber, what background and broad skill sets do you need to be involved in the creation of a squad mod like Dynamic Direction? That's generally a broad question. It depends on which role you're filling. For me, being you know programmer and uh, for all intents and purposes, the project lead, uh, tasking people, getting down to the nitty gritty of things. It's about understanding engineering and working with other people. I am an engineering student. I have also five years of coding experience, more or less. That may be an outdated number. I don't know. Uh, but, you know, there are a lot of other people on the team who are artists. They're, you know, good leaders. They know how to work with the game in general. Uh, or, you know, sometimes we just have people who punch in the right numbers when we tell them to. It all depends. What are the software and development tools that you rely upon? For the most part, it all revolves around the SDK, the squad editor, and um, its willingness to cooperate with us and be nice. That is very rare sometimes. <laughs> Beyond that, a couple modeling softwares here and there. Sometimes we play around with some audio software. It just depends on whoever our artists are. What is the difference between dynamic direction and the occupation game mode? Occupation itself is just a game mode. It is in DD, and it is one of the centerpieces of DD, but it is not DD. The whole thing that makes dynamic direction dynamic direction and differentiates it from something like the hardcore mod that had occupation in it is the focus and tailoring to a game mode like occupation that really broadens squad's horizons when it comes to what they seek to do. You know, squad is about communication, coordination, and conquest. And that's what dynamic direction is intending to instill in people. But it's also a more challenging experience and one that requires a lot more tactical thinking and know-how. Are all the vanilla squad maps available in dynamic direction? The answer is no. And they could be, but that would kind of suck. Occupation plays out best when people are given space to move on the map. If you confine them too much because you need to be in the circle no matter what, gameplay starts to slow down, it starts to get really trudgy, and it feels like <laughs> it doesn't feel fun. So we've cut out some of the smaller maps and some of the maps that don't flow quite well. Uh, examples of these would be Korra or Logar or Sumari that just wouldn't fit with dynamic directions, theme, and occupation in general. Karma, does the size and position of the IO vary? So as Robert mentioned before, a lot of occupation revolves around having a specific map size and freedom to breathe and plan. Uh, that was one of the things we tried to fix from vanilla AAS or even Invasion, was that a lot of the gameplay was rather linear. You didn't have much freedom as far as where you want to play in the map. Uh, you kind of just played where the game told you to play. 
Uh, one of the things that we wanted to fix with occupation was giving the players freedom again to choose what parts of the map they decided were significant and where they wanted to play, whether it's the establishment of their forward operating base or their patrol base, or if they wanted to hold certain advantageous terrain or uh, ground features or buildings. And you can't really do that when you restrict the objective zone to these, you know, 50 by 50 meter boxes that uh, squad objectives are usually. It's very small compounds or courtyards or very small uh, parts of the map where focused gameplay is existing, but also just eliminates all other possibilities of fighting anywhere else on the map. Uh, for example, if you're playing an AAS round, most players who know how to play squad know that if you aren't on either the attack or defense objective, you are irrelevant and you need to be playing on the objective. So one of the things that we did in DD was we opened up the map in the objective area so that everything within this AO was relevant. You could fight and hold where you wanted to because there was nowhere else you really needed or had to be because the game was telling you. And the only way we can achieve this kind of feel is if we opened up those AOs. So AOs generally vary map to map, but they sit between the one kilometer and 500 meter in uh, radius. What are the key elements of gameplay that you're looking to foster? So a lot of the mentality behind the changes within DD uh, revolve around A, having teamwork actually be a thing and communication, uh, and B, killing the lone wolf. Now that's two sides of the same coin essentially, but there's multiple changes that we've made that push it in either direction. Uh, we've made it harder for lone wolfers to you know, complete team objectives, whether that's destroying fobs because they're able to ninja solo into the fob or solo cap areas. Uh, we made it so that almost every aspect of DD requires teamwork. Now that being said, we've also made the teamwork aspects of everything a lot easier. Uh, for example, team buddy revives or working with your teammates in conjunction with, you know, either that being more ammo bags, easier revives, like I mentioned before, uh, or just better tools within the squad so that your squad can work cohesively. Uh, that was all things and changes that we've made to make sure that we can kind of build that environment. One of the biggest kind of changes that we made that demonstrates this is the change to the map information. Uh, players, when they're playing in dynamic direction, can only see their squad and other squad leaders. So now that information kind of gives you a little bit more of an intimate experience by letting you focus on what your squad is doing, not what the team is doing, which usually allows experienced players to use that information and to lone wolf in the proper directions. What are some of the bigger mechanic and gameplay adjustments that have been implemented in order to achieve that? Well, I think the biggest one is the game mode implementation and how we've essentially come up with a new game mode in its entirety, uh, where you have this large AO, similar and inspired from King of the Hill, just to give you a large area to play within. But controlling that area is not everything. Uh, you have certain mechanics within this zone that allow you and your team to work together as an entire platoon in order to push the enemy out. Uh, that being limiting the fobs to a single fob within the zone, so you no longer have this weird meta of having these random 10 fobs spread out all over the map, and now the team is completely fragmented, all spawning on their own spawns, which really doesn't give you the best team sense. Uh, now everything is kind of focused on what the platoon is doing cohesively because you only have that one fob. We've also added in patrol bases, which are an important mechanic in dynamic direction. Uh, patrol bases are essentially smaller, limited time fobs. What that means is they usually last about 15 minutes, and upon completion of that timer, they actually decrease tickets from the enemy. So going back to the themes of teamwork and also dynamic gameplay that gives the players freedom, players are able to choose where they want to put down their one fob that is, you know, the primary objective, as well as these dynamic secondary objectives called patrol bases. And like I said, these decrease or disappear over time, which means that they're constantly moving around the map, uh, generating conflict in certain areas and focusing gameplay, but giving the players the power to put them where they want them, when they want to place them, and how they're going to use them, because they can actually be used offensively or defensively. Robo, what have been some of the biggest challenges you've faced? Uh, I'll, I'll be honest, it's kind of a difficult one, uh, because everything is challenging when it comes to the SDK, uh, but I wouldn't say any of these challenges have necessarily been bigger or smaller. Uh, there are two really big things that we've had to deal with during the course of development since 
uh, last October, actually. Uh, the first of which is when we started moving things around and getting the mod structured in its current state, right, as dynamic direction. We started with, I think, 8.6 thousand errors that had to go, that I had to go in and clean up uh, just through the code and stuff. And that took like six months to finally get finished. I think we finished it a week before the mod release back in March, cleaned up a few extra bugs and went from there. Uh, one of the more recent challenges we've been having is performance. Performance is huge, especially in squad, making sure that you aren't stuttering, you have a good server tick rate, and everything is running okay is a very, very big challenge, uh, especially when you have something that is a mod that's not directly attached to the game. You can only use blueprinting. There are some things you can do to clean it up and mitigate it, but it's always a continual challenge to find the best optimal ways to do things. Come a cut. I'd love to hear your thoughts on what type of player Dynamic Direction is perfect for. If you couldn't tell by now, we're trying to bring out a lot of that teamwork and communication from the early days of Squad, back when Squad was a relatively more niche game, straight out of early access. You kind of knew who all the good SLs were, and there was a standard for how much communication, teamwork, and just usage of overall tactics in each game. Nowadays, when I think a lot of players hop on into a squad match, it's a crapshoot as far as what kind of experience they're going to get. They don't know who the other squad leaders are or if they can trust these other players or if they're going to get that same hardcore experience. And I think this has led to a lot of, you know, vet burnout within squad. It's because there's no easy way for this knowledge transfer from experienced SLs to newer or newbie SLs. And the general player base just as a whole uh, loses a little bit of that special touch of that tactics that communication and over time with the you know successful growth of the game which is great the quality of the player base has decreased so by making things a little bit harder a little bit more hardcore and really really enforcing or encouraging teamwork and communication as in if you don't use teamwork or communication you're going to have a bad time or your team will fail that's the kind of environment we're trying to create is a place where these tactics can still be used because i think nowadays whenever anyone logs into a match of squad online you don't really know what you're going to get and it's led to a lot of vet burnout and it's why a lot of the experienced SLs that i know no longer play the game so that's kind of the experience that we're trying to grow robber the infantry movement in dynamic direction is very different what are the changes you've made compared to vanilla squad so this actually breaks down into two segments a lot of what you'll see in dynamic direction is that all the factions are broken into either conventional or irregular forces, and each kind of has its own sub-mechanics. Uh, movement is not an exception to that rule. The conventional forces are a little bit slower in terms of their general walking, uh, whereas the INS are a little bit faster. They both work off the sta same stamina pool, but that stamina pool does have some changes to it for both. However, how that stamina pool gets used is a lot different compared to vanilla, and it applies to both factions. We actually have a sprinting curve that starts you off very fast. You get probably about 10 or 15% of your stamina running very fast. Then it starts dropping. And it will keep dropping, dropping, dropping. Your speed of sprint will keep dropping until you run out of stamina. And what happens when you run out of stamina, before in Vanilla Squad, you had the jog option, where you kind of go a little bit faster, and you just wouldn't regen any stamina. In Dynamic Direction, we don't allow that. We stop players straight out from sprinting as soon as they're out of stamina. They can't do the jog. And if they want to start sprinting again, they have to get back to 20% stamina. Essentially, what we've done is we've made it so that players who want to sprint need to have some stamina, and there has to be some stamina management. Were those changes made to encourage tactical movement? One of the biggest things we were noticing is players would rush headfirst into things, just jog away, constantly holding the W key. It, it wasn't conducive to the tactical 
teamwork oriented play we were looking for. This question is for you, Kama. What are the changes and tweaks to the medical system in dynamic direction? I think in Vanilla Squad, you see a lot of players not wanting to wait for revives, whether that be because they're just straight up bored and they don't want to sit there, or just medic revives are the only viable revives within squad. Rifleman revives in squad, I think, are way too punishing for no reason, and that's why as soon as your medics give up, usually in Vanilla Squad, we're telling teammates to just give up if there's no medic, because rifleman to rifleman or you know non-medic revives are just so absolutely terrible. Uh, they take way too long, somewhere like 20 seconds, and when you come up, you can't even sprint, you can't even see anything, you're essentially at 1% health. And that's just not a kind of revive that players are willing to wait for. So in order to change these problems that we've noticed in Vanilla Squad with the revive system, what we've done is essentially we've made buddy revives a lot more viable. The time is now a lot shorter, though medic revives are still faster, and you come up with more health and you are able to regain stamina when you're buddy revived. And from making these changes, what we end up seeing is players will actually wait to get revived from their friendlies and friendlies will go out of their way riflemen included to revive the other players instead of leaving that burden to the medics and only to the medics and that, that just causes so many problems because if your medic is gone no one wants to wait for a non-medic revive because of how bad it is there it just takes way too long and the health and the stamina kind of restriction on non-medic revives is just way too punishing so now you get more bandages for every medic and for every rifleman and you actually are encouraged to wait for someone to help you even if it's not a medic and you go out of your way now to assist other down players even if you're not a medic because it is not so much of a pain in the ass this question is for both of you have there been any modifications to armor performance in dynamic direction wrap up have any tweaks been made to armor performance? Depends on what you mean by armor. Technically, no. However, we have buffed infantry carried AT. And that's what really matters, I believe, in this context, is the buff to infantry AT. Infantry AT has a slight penetration buff and a fairly large damage buff. You can take out an IFE in two or three hits from a lat, uh, one to two hits from a hat. Now, it forces armor to work with infantry to clear out other infantry and focus primarily on enemy vehicles. And once they've beaten those enemy vehicles, their reward is being able to you know, go out and attack the infantry and work with them instead. How ever they aren't allowed to run rampant in addition to what rub has mentioned one of the things that we noticed in vanilla squad gameplay was that a lot of players were prioritizing armor over the lives of the infantry just because of that extremely long respawn time as well as the ticket loss so normally you're supposed to be using this armor to assist your infantry and in getting them into tough places exposing the armor instead of the infantry because it because it is more protected it because it is armored but now in vanilla squad a lot of players will see these armored vehicles will just run at the first sign of trouble now granted we have improved at from the infantry perspective and making it so that infantry at does actually have the capability to damage these heavier armed vehicles but what we've done on the flip side of things is we've decreased the respawn time for every armored vehicle as well as the ticket loss which means that these armored vehicles though more fragile are up much sooner which means that vehicle crews now have more freedom to work more closely with the infantry to get them onto target and to assist them on objectives. How important are roles such as engineer and sapper in dynamic direction? For our game mode specifically, occupation, one of the things that we wanted to bring out in that game mode was inspiration from insurgency, which is a PR and even squad game mode that doesn't really get played much anymore. And the premise of insurgency is that conventional forces are searching for irregular force caches and weapon equipment dumps. And upon finding them, conventional forces must destroy them. Well, in Occupation, we kind of took that general search and destroy kind of dynamic, and we applied it to the fobs that players can place down, which means that if you're playing as the insurgents or the irregular faction, you can actually choose exactly where you want to place that cache. Whether, rather than having it dictated to you from the game, players have control over where they want, over where they want their objectives to be, which is like... Which is, like I said, one of the most important things we wanted to kind of give players is that freedom. 
So being able to go out with your team as conventional forces when you're fighting the insurgents or the militia, find these caches and give you that search and for and give you that search and destroy kind of experience was very important to us. So having an engineer with your squads that are attacking, being able to plant charges on those weapon caches once you find them is definitely critical to the occupation game mode. It's hard not to notice that there is a refreshing lack of marksmen in dynamic direction. What inspired that choice? So unfortunately, I think a lot of players, when they think about marksmen within squad, there's a very bad connotation or kind of stereotypical marksman that comes to mind. And that's the player that kind of runs off, thinks he's, you know, Chris Kyle sitting in a bush 300 meters away from his friendlies and just picking off players. And although an argument can be made that DMRs are used in real life to affect, one thing that a lot of players forget is that these players that pick up DMR kits in game, they don't necessarily have that experience or have that training. And especially with how popular squad is, a lot of people pick up that DMR or sniper roll and go run off into the wind with it. We also noticed that this being a video game, there weren't really that many situations that needed marksmen, especially with how easy it is to shoot players at range in a video game like squad. The marksman just ended up being lone wolfing riflemen and so removing it we noticed that that didn't really impact gameplay they didn't have an integral or important or critical role within the squad at least in the ways that we were seeing it being used and so we just opted to remove it for the availability of other classes whether that be your engineer those are more common your ars or mmgs or even your hats which are much more useful kits than marksmen in squad the player spawning system is different from Vanilla Squad. How is it different and why were those changes made? So one of the things that we took inspiration from the One Life events was, and you can actually see this in a couple of other games as well, is that the longer players have to wait when they die, the less they want to die. And that's kind of how you get a little bit of that realistic experience thrown into a game is by making players really want to think about how they're going to use that life that they spawned in with and not letting them respawn or catch rally waves that that is the squad meta because they'll end up just giving up i think i see a lot of players in vanilla squad when they notice that they can game that rally when it's down to like the last 15 seconds or 10 seconds players are actually encouraged to give up in squad which i think is a terrible mechanic so what we've done is actually increase the spawn times for fob and rally spawns and these are no longer on wave timers which means that no matter when you go down you will always have to wait a minimum amount of time which absolutely disincentivizes you from giving up and by disincentivizing people giving up or by increasing that respawn time players are more incentivized to work together as a team stay within you know not arms reach but pretty close to other friendlies so that those buddy revives that we talked about earlier that were buffed are actually applicable so what you end up seeing is less lone wolfing because lone wolfing e because lone wolfing equals giving up equals long spawn time and more team play because anyone in the squad can pick up anyone else reasonably player icons display very differently on the tactical map what is that all about so we also noticed that in a lot of the video games and platoon shooters today a lot of the players are given way too much information on the map and a lot of experienced players will abuse this and there's multiple ways to abuse it and it's why you see in a lot of my videos i have the map up a lot it's because being fed real-time information on an entire team-wide scenario as well as accurate marks immediately upon seeing the enemy gives your team just way too much information to be able to lone wolf and so a lot of experienced players i know this because i've done this will open up their map in vanilla squad look at how the team is situated look at where the enemy markers are and immediately start spawning on the random fob that they have and start walking towards the enemy or figuring out how or figuring out how to best exploit the situation. By decreasing the amount of information on the map, right now squad members can only see other squad members and only other squad leaders, what this ends up doing is really shrinking the battle space for that player to where they're actually only focused on their squad as it should be and less so the team state. Now the team leader or the squad leader actually has their squad under control and they can coordinate with other squad leaders on the map in order to figure out how they're going to use their combined squads to attack and take objectives, rather than every man for himself using all the information on the map all the time. Yeah, I've noticed it's very important dynamic direction to PID your targets, in case you're about to kill a friendly. I'd like now to talk about the differences between conventional and irregular forces within dynamic direction. What are the differences in mechanics and what sort of gameplay are you looking to foster with those differences? So I think when a lot of vanilla players think about how INS or Militia plays right now in squad vanilla gameplay, 
They are essentially set up exactly like conventional forces. Because of the game modes, AAS and Invasion don't really have any asymmetrical play, and there aren't really that many asymmetrical differences between the factions. So playing as them in vanilla gameplay against the conventional factions without any change in gameplay does end up feeling like you're getting absolutely annihilated by a superior uh, conventional force with better equipment. So we wanted to kind of bring back that asymmetrical gameplay that was existent in Insurgency by giving them a different style of play. Conventional forces play as a conventional force. You have all the equipment, you have the resources, and you have the power to work as a singular force. Whereas the changes that we made to Insurgents and um, and militia, we give them more spawn points and they're able to flood the map and really spread out. So you actually get those hit and run, those ambushes, and that kind of natural or native force feel to the faction. One of the biggest things that we've done is we've let insurgent and unconventional or irregular factions start earlier than conventional, which means that they're already on the board moving around and setting up by the time conventional forces get there. You've mentioned conventional forces are able to place patrol bases. What is a patrol base and how should it be used? Robert. Patrol bases are a way of rewarding players for taking control of ground rather than simply farming the enemy off their fob. Patrol bases are temporary spawns. They're 15 minutes. They are intentionally not very easy to defend. You only get sandbags and ammo crates at most. It's also a giant tent that enemies have to dig down within that 15 minute time period. If it survives the 15 minutes, the enemy will bleed. Otherwise, if they get it down, friendlies lose tickets, right? It's not meant to be super punishing to a team that doesn't use them correctly, but they are supposed to lose it if they don't use it correctly, and then it goes back on a timer and they can't place it down again. Uh, how they're generally supposed to be used is you take a piece of ground, you ensure it's secure, right? So a good example of this is if the enemy is in their fob, right? You've pushed them back to their fob. That's when you start placing patrol bases. And, you know, you could place one as an attack fob, or you could place one in defense just in case they break a couple squads out from their fob or send a helicopter from Maine. But the general idea is you place it somewhere safe, somewhere where it's useful, and you use it for those 15 minutes to attack or defend, right? And it's generally supposed to pull out enemies from their fob if you see an enemy put down a PB, you need to go out and attack it because if you don't or you start to too late, you lose tickets. And that is massive when you're talking about the ticket pools you have in DD. You lose 75 tickets every time a patrol ends, an enemy patrol ends. And that's huge in terms of ticket pools. Players should be using these to draw the enemy into contact and as a strategic position but they need to make sure that the position they're placing it in is secure first. Previously before, when we only had FOB versus FOB gameplay within the zone, it would end up feeling extremely stagnant, very meat grindy, and a lot of emphasis was put on just turtling and defending these points. With patrol bases, we now have dynamic objectives that are hopping around the map that generate conflict and attention. Uh, these patrol bases do a lot of damage to the enemy team if left unchecked. So it's a priority for your team to hunt down enemy patrol bases as soon as you notice them. So they kind of draw players into a localized area that is not just a fob attack or defense for an hour or two hours. Now you're constantly playing this game of cat and mouse hunting each other's patrol bases and putting them down in different positions every 15 or 20 so minutes. So I think it's done a great job of kind of breaking up that stalemate between the fobs and it should be used as a tool to both augment your defense or assist in your attack every time that you place it down. And players should be focused on destroying these as soon as they find them. So make sure yours are well defended because they're pretty fragile. You can only build sandbags and it's pretty easy to take them out. So it requires a lot of thinking of where you want to place these. But once again, we want to give that freedom to the players as far as where they want to focus the gameplay and how they want to augment the map to their team's needs. How does still division factor into dynamic direction? Robert. This is another question I get a lot. A lot of people think that 
our partnership with Steel Division is going to be a one-to-one import. When generally speaking, that's not the idea we're going for. Uh, Steel Division and Impact Studios were very kind in allowing us to use their assets and giving us access to them. Uh, And we're grateful for that. But there are a lot of things we need to tweak with those assets to make them fit our game, right? They fit Steel Division very well. They don't necessarily fit into dynamic direction right away. So how Steel Division factors into DD is primarily assets. We are going to be using a lot of their assets and some of the technology that comes with those assets to further develop dynamic direction and to prop up our own content creation with our team of artists and modders in the future. What does the process of including Steel Division assets into dynamic direction look like? Depends on what kind of uh, asset you're talking about. For the technology, what including Steel Division looks like is not necessarily a copy-paste job like a asset would, a simple skeletal mesh. Um, generally, what it would look like on the programming end is I create an object, I look at and read all the logic that they used to create their system, I find ways to optimize it to fit into DD, make sure that logically it's still doing the same things, and then we go from there. For art, generally what happens is I will go and I'll look through the assets, and I'll say, hey, this asset has a problem here. Hey, I'd like this asset to look this way instead of that way. And we test that out to one of our wonderful and very talented artists to get it fixed before it gets implemented. If there are no issues, it's a very simple copy and paste job and we set it up just like we would any other weapon in squad. Karma, what are your future plans for dynamic direction? So at this point, we have the majority of our gameplay pretty fleshed out. There are always things that we can improve and tweak. And in terms of balance, that's a very high concern for us. But we want to make sure that the initial gameplay or release of dynamic direction does feel pretty stable and gives players the freedom to use the tactics, teamwork and communication that we're actually all craving on the harder on the hardcore side of things. And we think it's in a pretty good place at this point. A lot of our design decisions have been finalized. And at this point, the team, as mentioned before, is focused on importing the Steel Division and Impact Studio assets in our own fashion so that we can actually bring you new content, new weapons, new vehicles, and new factions. So that's the stage that we're in now. Who knows where we might go in the future as far as other gameplay mechanics or features that we add, or even a whole new game mode in and of itself. But we're pretty happy with where we're at right now, and that's the stage of development that we're focused on. Yeah. Dynamic direction is very much about the gameplay first. We feel that Squad needed some sort of correction in terms of its gameplay to get the experience we were looking for. That gameplay is foundational, and we've laid that foundation at this point. From there, all that's left is to build on top of it. And like we've said before, that's going to be with new content. We're going to be creating new factions, you know, maybe new maps, maybe new equipment. We'll, we'll see what happens, right? But beyond that, we're just going to do what we can to make the experience and the gameplay fresh and interesting for as long as we can keep it. A lot of changes have been made to the commander role for each team, both in terms of cooldowns and available assets. Karma, if I get you to detail some of those changes. The, the whole commander role is extremely reliant on the platoon working together, and it's kind of a chicken and the egg, where like a solid platoon will be augmented greatly by a competent commander, uh, and a competent commander can organize a team that does not necessarily have that leadership or organization. Um, and that is mainly done via admin control, because there's no way we can honestly say, hey, the commander needs to be focused on his job. We're going to make a system that the commander can only be a one-man squad in-game. That's an admin thing that we have to monitor and enforce on our end. So seeing that, though, and and just that importance on teamwork and coordination, uh, we've started seeing commander roles become an actual thing. Players will play the commander, and they won't just use it for the co- commander call-ins, but they'll constantly be organizing, communicating with the team, especially with the lower respawn or cooldown timers on the assets. They're able to influence the map much more. Uh, granted, they, those have been nerfed greatly, so they're not obliterating fobs every five minutes, but they're they're dropping airstrikes. They're using the UAV pretty much in perpetuity. Like that, that thing, it lasts just as long as the cooldown, I'm pretty sure. 
Uh, so they're always in the UAV. They're looking and analyzing the map. They're mar marking things down. They're communicating with the team leaders to make sure that they're going in the direction they need to go. They're making sure the FOB has enough supplies and who's running them, uh, as well as dropping airstrikes, assets, smoke as needed. All right. So one more thing. Come as as generally speaking, you're you're considered to be the uh, the godfather or the the inventor of the super FOB. For those people who might say that dynamic direction is just an excuse to uh, go crazy with super fobs, what what would be your uh, your response to that? Now, my response to that would be: Squad has so many things going for it, whether it be the construction system, the logistics system, um, and there's been a lot of work from OWI side as far as making sure that people can build fobs. I believe it's kind of feels like in their original tent that fobs are supposed to be built up. The problem is that their vanilla game modes don't intend for it. So as far as super fobbing, I'd say that's almost a game mechanic that should exist. You know, being able to super fob your forward operating base and turn it into a forward operating base is very much so an intent. That being said, it's not just super fob simulator because we do give you the, the freedom to patrol, to set up patrol bases. It's not necessarily having to slug it out over the super fob. Uh, players are constantly working in different parts of the map simultaneously uh, to gain control or positional advantage in order to just beat out the other team when it comes to gunfighting. Uh, so being able to super fob is definitely, I would say, something that we want to see. It's not necessarily something that we want to discourage, but the important thing to note is that it is not the only way to play occupation. There are many different viable strategies as far as how teams want to operate. And that I think is the key behind occupation is that you can super fob. You can also maneuver the map. You can also work from patrol bases and 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 attack the enemy or flank the enemy or set up ambushes yourself there's that that's the key to occupation is to unlock all of these different play styles instead of get on the objective get on the objective get on the objective which is extremely linear and doesn't give players any tactical ability um, aside from where they're placing their fobs which are so varied that no one even bothers building them up all right and you know one of the things about fobs <clears throat> and building up fobs that's a side effect gameplay wise of fobs being valuable. Now, the thing is the other side effect of fobs being valuable is they are being attacked. Now you have infantry coordinating to hit these fobs rather than fobs being something secondary to the actual game, right? In which case, if you want to have a fun game that actually lasts and actually have some sort of attacking and some sort of defending, some sort of actual dynamic in there and not have the stupid, okay, I'm going to sit on a point and I'm going to wait until the bar says I have captured this point. You need to have something defensible and something of value. Fobs do that in dynamic direction. If it ends up being because they're quote <coughs> super fobs, so be it. It doesn't actually affect the general gameplay and you know, yeah, when, <clears throat> players to see that for themselves. If you say the words forward operating base, that is what we're trying to make forward operating bases. Mm -hmm. uh, is we're trying to make them forward operating bases. They're not just let me drop the radio in a bush and drop the hat. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I that's why I think it it is in the original, maybe the original original intent that fobs were to be used as such, but has since been so perverted in vanilla gameplay because the game allows for that. All right, awesome. Thanks, guys. This concludes our interview with Karma Cut and the Rubber Pelican, the creators behind Dynamic Direction. We're now going to take a look how to get and install the Dynamic Direction mod. Assuming you already have squad, go to the Steam Squad Modding Workshop. Search for Dynamic Direction. Subscribe to the Dynamic Direction mod. While the mod downloads and installs, take a moment to peruse up-to-date Dynamic Direction game mechanic information. Get the full mod overview at Karma Cuts forum. Feel free to join in the discussion on the Steam Dynamic Direction workshop pages. Discover the mythic origins of the Superfob, or binge watch some lawn darts squad better goodness. Once your download and automatic install is complete, open up Squad in the server browser. Search for Karma Cut. Select the Karma Cut Community Dynamic Direction Public Squad server. Confirm you are playing a third party mod and get ready to join in the immersive, tactical, and teamwork oriented fun.
I would like to thank Karma Cut, the Rubber Pelican, and the Karma Cut community for their time, server access, and assistance in making this episode. As always, I aim to inform and entertain. I hope you have enjoyed watching Squad Better Episode 4, Dynamic Direction. To whet your appetite for more Squad Better content, I'm going to leave you with an excerpt from Squad Better Episode 3, Are All Marksmen Noobs? It features one of the many tongue-in-cheek cinematic scenes contained in that episode and is called The Chase. It is, with a great deal of national bias, my absolute pleasure to introduce the HK-417, the designated marksman rifle of the Australian Defence Force. Designed and developed by Heckler & Co in the 1990s, it entered service in 2005. In 2010, the Australian Defence Force procured $1.6 million worth of HK-417 rifles. The variant used by the Australian marksman in squad is the 16-inch recon variant. Other variants available had a 12-inch and 20-inch barrel, all of which were user-changeable in the field. The HK-417 is a gas-operated, modular-designed selective fire weapon, using a short-stroke gas piston located above the barrel that operates the seven-lug rotating bolt, which sits in a bolt carrier and operates in a forged alloy receiver resembling those of the stoner-designed AR-10, AR-15 and M16 rifles. Its internal design is almost the same as the smaller NATO caliber HK416, although the receiver and working parts are enlarged to suit the 762 by 51 mm cartridge. The early HK417 prototype used 20 round magazines from the G3 rifle family, which did not feature a bolt hold open device. Later prototypes, however, switched to a polymer magazine with bolt hold open. In squad, it comes with a 20 round detachable box magazine. Due to its long range and good accuracy, the HK417 fits well into the designated marksman role and comes with the same Trigicon 6X ACOG in use on the L129A1 sharpshooter rifle. Fitted with four Picatinny rails and a free float handguard as standard, in squad this battle rifle features a bipod and foregrip, and although not implemented, it is interesting to note it also can accept a modified 40mm grenade launcher clamped directly to the bottom rail. The HK-417 was introduced in the version 2.15 update of Squad, and while I rarely play Marksman, this weapon is a personal favourite. Share this video with other players who you meet who are new to this game so they can also squad better. <laughs>